Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us here at Surrey Wildlife Trust for our fourth and final webinar of the Community Action for Nature series. Um, we're very pleased to, to be welcoming you all today. I'm just going to let a few more people sign in just as we've got people popping in straight away. Wonderful. Um, so just while people are coming in, um, as you log in, perhaps you would like to just pop your name and what um, community group you're from in our chat chat button i know there's probably a few people who might have already been here one of our webinars before today you'll know the drill so yeah please do pop a little message in our chat but um, function and let us know where you're from um which community group you are representing today so um yes we'll just let that pop along we've got quite a few people popping in now wonderful excellent um so it's really exciting to be here today with you and it'd be really nice to see um, all the different communities and where we are from from around the country so yeah don't be shy do say hello um, let's just see how we're doing yes we've got lots of people popping in now um, just while that is happening I will just introduce myself my name oh hang on a second I've just popped up to see the clap we've got Claire, wonderful. Here we go. We've got lots of people popping in now. Claire from the Community Orchard Project, Rob from Chobham Commons Preservation, Rosemary from the WI. Brilliant. Excellent. Wonderful to see all these people popping in um, and a very big welcome. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, my name's Emma Rothwell. I um, am part of the education engagement team. I am the Wilder Schools team leader, so I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, and we've got a really impressive um, set of speakers again for you for our, our fourth session, um, which I will introduce to you very shortly. But just while we're getting everybody signed in and we're getting organised, just a little bit of housekeeping to go through so that we are all happy with what's going to be happening. Um, we will be recording this webinar again today, um, just in case um, there's any issues with the internet goes down or whatever at your end, you will then be able to access this recording um, on our website. Um, and there's also any previous webinars that have happened will are also on the website, you'll be able to catch them up. Um, so that we and we'll also I think we're going to be sharing them with the wider wildlife trusts as well. There will be an opportunity for you to ask any of our speakers some questions at the end of our um, the session today. So rather than during while the speakers are delivering their presentation, if a question comes to you, then please use the chat, um, sorry, the question, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, pop your question in there. And then at the very end, after everybody has um, done their presentations, we'll go through and I'll answer those questions. But please do feel free to use the chat function to chat with each each other um, or to discuss anything share ideas connect with other people because um, that that is what that's for but please be aware obviously that everyone has got everyone can see that so um, and we'll be re re keeping a track on, on there as well and sharing that with everybody um, so yes that will all be happening while we're going ahead um, I think that's the only little bits of housekeeping we need to do let me just have a little look we've got quite a few we're bumping our numbers up now, wonderful. And lots of people saying hello in the chat. So really nice to see if those of you who've just logged in, um, wonderful to see you here for our fourth webinar. So, um, while we before we get started i would just like to say thank you very much for all our speakers who are joining us today um, for our webinar and we hope that you enjoy today this evening session. And I'm without any further delay, I'm, we're going to start with our first speaker, which is our wonderful Ben Sigury, um, who's going to put his camera on in a moment and come and join us. Here he comes. Um, ben is our GIS Research and Monitoring Manager and Space for Nature Doctoral Practitioner at Surrey Wildlife Trust. So, um, yes, he's going to carry on. I shall pass over to you, Ben. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I feel like every time I do this, my title has got even longer, so it seems to get more ridiculous. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emma. Um, and hi, everyone on the webinar today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about connectivity as an ecological concept a bit and also a little bit around the work we've done 
uh, trying to model connectivity in the county and how we've applied that um, in different contexts um, in a project that we did recently with Surrey County Council and then sort of finish by reflecting on okay I've just talked about loads of kind of academic big abstract concepts but what does that mean on the ground for people like yourselves and community groups actually doing the things so um, let me share my screen now um, and crack on Emma, please let me know if it's uh, like the wrong side of the screen or anything like that. But hopefully you're all looking at um, what you're supposed to be. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Ben. Excellent. So I'd like to start by just thinking about defining what we actually mean when we're talking about connectivity and the concept of nature. So what a lot of people refer to and what you might have come across before was a 2010 white paper by a guy called John Lawton um, and it was a paper published for the government and essentially it stated that nature needed to be bigger it needed to be better and it needed to be more joined up and that's kind of become the gospel for a lot of conservation organizations moving on from that and their mantra in terms of what they need to be doing um, and making a difference and that's kind of gone through lots of forms um, and you might have heard of living landscapes nature recovery networks all, all of this stuff is talking about the same thing. It's all about the landscape being more joined up and having less resistance to the species being able to move across it. So um, you can think of it as stepping stones. So um, in the kind of diagram on the screen over here, you can see that um, there's examples of kind of little stepping stones of habitat between larger patches of habitat. You can see it as corridors where you might have like linear corridors of trees or hedgerows, for example, as ways of joining up again larger patches of habitat. And this is really important because obviously one of the biggest challenges we face is habitat fragmentation, things being separated from each other and species being able to move around less. So by joining things up, we are enabling new sites to be colonized. We're enabling sites that we've restored to be recolonized by um, rare species and things like that. But it's also very, very important with regards to climate change. So as I'm sure many of you know, with climate change, it pushes species to migrate either northwards or up to a higher altitude as their range shifts um, into a kind of different, different zone because of temperature changes. And um, to be able to actually make these movements, they need the landscape to be connected. And if they don't, um, have that opportunity, they remain where they are in those isolated patches, they're unable to move and eventually the conditions in that location become completely un unsuitable and unviable for that species and that's where we start to see extinctions and things like that. So all in all really really important thing and it's on everyone's radar very much in the conservation world. So it has a little bit of a kind of history of this being um, part of the wildlife trusts um, and in Surrey and our, our kind of vision of it. About 10 years ago, um, we started throwing around the term biodiversity opportunity areas. And again, that might be something that you've heard about, but don't necessarily know too much about what it is. Um, so as part of a kind of wider Southeast project about a decade ago, um, they use national character areas to define these biodiversity opportunity areas. So there's obviously these ones for Surrey, but there's also ones for the rest of the Southeast counties as well. And they all kind of join up across the borders. So you can see um, on the uh, east side over here, there's parts of the green blob that go over into Kent. Um, and similarly, over, over on this side over here, you have parts of the reds and the purples that go into places like Hampshire. So it's this big joined up network of kind of areas of habitat and all of them are defined by the kind of core geology and the core landscapes that you see in those areas. So for example, the yellow ones are the North Downs and they're really characterized by having rich chalk grasslands and um, Katie's project that she'll talk about later is very much focused in that zone. We've got the purple ones, which are the Heathen um, over on Chopham Common and places like that. Uh, we've got the rivers as well. So you can see that there's lots of different um, boas or biodiversity opportunity areas and they're all kind of representing a different kind of habitat and they all have species associated with them that um, live and thrive in those conditions. So these are the places that we think are the most important essentially. This is where you should focus your conservation efforts where you already have high quality sites um, and the areas surrounding them. You already have key populations of species so you should focus your efforts there and you will get the most bang for your buck. And as you can see, the idea is that they all do kind of join into each other. And the majority of the white bits are the kind of urban areas in between those. Um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. 
it's not just the wildlife trusts that are really into this idea as well bug life um, have a project called beelines which you might have heard about as well and these are their insect super highways they've mapped that for the entirety of the uk and they're these kind of i think they're about 30 kilometer 30 or three kilometer wide stretches of um corridor essentially where they say these are the most important places for pollinators to move around the country so um, as you can see those line up quite nicely with a lot of the boas so you have very much one going right through the middle there through guildford which lines up almost exactly with the North Downs area. So, you know, we're singing from the same hymn sheet and we're talking about the same places and identifying them as important for the same reasons. Um, and the bee lines as well, you might have heard about in some of our other webinars are going to be um, quite important in our Space for Nature project uh, that's ongoing at the moment. And we're gonna be using those bee lines to target areas for habitat restoration. So this is all great. Connectivity is really important. We all recognize it and we're all trying to work in those areas to improve it. But there's also a kind of underlying problem whereby there's a lack of actual evidence for the effectiveness of all of the things we're doing. So we think we're doing things to enhance connectivity and we're, we're trying our best. But you can see from this graph here that was from a study done by Kent Wildlife Trust, actually, that the vast majority of conservation actions, people don't really know. Either there's no evidence, it's not been assessed, it's unknown, um, there's a trade-off in comparison to a small number that you're we're quite confident are beneficial so there's obviously a bit more work that needs to be done in this space in order for us to understand how to improve connectivity in the best possible way and take it into account in all of the kind of actions we're taking so that's where i come on to what i've worked on over the last couple of years in my role at the wildlife trust is about trying to actually put a number to this quite abstract concept and be able to measure it and quantify it so you can think about connectivity in two ways. Structural is quite straightforward because you're literally thinking about does this thing touch this other thing? And if they touch, they are connected and things can move between them. That's great. That's quite easy if you're um, work, you can imagine if you're doing a bit of GIS and you're working on a map, it's quite a simple thing to look at where things are touching and where things aren't touching. Where it becomes more complicated is when you try and incorporate a deeper ecological understanding of how that works, where you think about, OK, but if I was a species in the ground, what what conditions, what obstacles, what resistance am I going to encounter? So you have the idea of functional connectivity, which is about the suitability of the landscape to be moved across by species. So if if I have area A and area B, is, is there going to be a movement facilitated between those two areas by the conditions that are in between them? Is it a motorway that's a completely impenetrable, bar impenetrable barrier? Or is it a kind of nice semi-species rich grassland that it's not too much of a problem for a species to cross? So the functional connectivity is clearly the one more accurately aligned with reality, but it's obviously then also the one that is more difficult to try and assign a number to and work out when you're looking at it on a map. So there's lots of ways that people have approached this problem. Uh, and the one that we we chose and went down the route of was an idea called circuit theory. And circuit theory proposes that the connectivity of the landscape is a bit like electrical currents. You have core areas, which are your batteries, and then in between your core areas, you have this grid of different resistances and like electricity, it will always take the path of least resistance through the landscape to get from area A to area B. So we can apply this kind of thinking and we can tell the model how resistant different bits of the landscape are based on what's there. Is it a road? Is it a river? Is it... Um, a particularly poor quality patch of habitat is a housing estate. So there's lots of kind of information that you can include in those these models and make them quite complex and um, try and mirror the kind of reality for these species as best you can and give give the model an idea of what resistance actually means for those things and therefore which routes are the most likely routes for them, where are their big barriers and by identifying obviously where those big barriers are that can help us target our conservation interventions because we realize oh we we need a new stepping stone there for example to enable things to move around so going into kind of some examples of um applying this stuff in a real world context we we recently had a big piece commissioned by surrey county council which was 
the long overdue update to the biodiversity opportunity areas um, called which we dubbed the urban boas. So the idea that obviously 10 years ago, we set up this network of boas, but we always envisaged that someone at some point was going to have to consider all the gaps in between them, which are Surrey's major towns like Guildford and Woking, Epsom and Yule, and um, think about what, what those meant as um, a barrier to the wildlife moving from one rural boa to another rural boa. So for SCC, this was really important for them because it was about developing their green and blue infrastructure strategies for those places. And for us, it was really important because it, it finally gave us that opportunity to um, do, like I say, envisage the how much of a barrier are our towns in Surrey. So we applied that model and that thinking um, around connectivity and circuit theory. Um, and we put lots of different variables in it around looking at different green spaces. And we worked very closely with our ecological consultancy to kind of develop these outputs. So we had, um, we developed these heat maps, which are kind of showing you the green areas are highly connected. The red areas are poorly connected and the yellow is the kind of filtering out of things in between them, the different gradation of yellow. Um, so you can see that across Guildford, there are clearly some bits that connect that make quite nice green corridors in Guildford and then other bits where there are some real real blockages there. So um, and then what you can see on the other other screen, other side, the right hand side is where we translated this into land parcels that made much more sense for the people actually who are the local planning authority and the borough council officers who actually need to interpret this and use it because it's great to have a complicated sort of scientific diagram but it needs to be translated into a language that makes sense to the people who need to use it so we translated that into the land parcels so we identified from the kind of colorful map where, where were those optimal corridors and then stuck on top of those optimal corridors, the different land boundaries um, to help them identify which sites and which land ownership they needed to work with to improve those green corridors across Guildford. So, and alongside this, the uh, ecological consultancy provided guidance and management uh, plans um, to enable them to do that as well. So, Although this was completed relatively recently and we haven't really seen the fruits of our efforts yet, we're hoping it's going to be a really important piece in the puzzle for uh, green infrastructure in Surrey moving forward. So um, another example is more, more of an internal one. So what you see here is the idea of using this model in a predictive way. So kind of starting with what what's it like now and then a hypothetical version of what it might be like if we do x y and z things i say <laughs> i didn't realize how long ago this was done since the first one's 2019 we're in 2023 now um so what was it like four years ago versus what might it be like in 2050 so the the idea being here is we we have identified some priority sites for habitat improvement and if hypothetically all of those sites were restored in the way that we plan in 2050 this is how connected this patch of the north downs would be so you can see that happily that that justifies that what we're doing is the right thing because we can see that with the implementation of that those restorations the green along the kind of southern spine of the north downs is much stronger and more consistent and joined up and there's much more green going on in the north, northern sections as well. And quite importantly, we can see that there is actually starting to be shades of green and yellow flowing between the boundary here of the two, um, two boas. So this is NDO3 on the right and NDO2 on the left. And the gap in between them, I think, is the A24. And you can see, even though there is a major road there, because there's enough habitat on either side, it's starting to enable that flow even across two boas separated by um, a quite an impenetrable feature. So this is great. We can apply these models and we can evidence what we're doing in conservation. We can pat ourselves on the back and telling us we're doing the right thing. Um, but what does what that mean for people like you? Why is that relevant? So I wanted to, to finish off reflecting on that. And what does that mean on the ground? Because what, what it means is that people working in community gardens and community groups um, should be empowered and informed to do interventions that promote connectivity as well. 
I would love to be able to capture all of that information and use it in our models um, and be able to see the impact of community groups um, and their contribution to improving connectivity. And I think that maybe that's something Claire's potentially working on in the future without dropping her in it too much. But you can see um, just from some of the examples I've picked out here, things like wildlife gardening, um, things like the Blue Heart Road verges that I'm sure some of you are familiar with, things like having wildlife friendly allotments, all of those are really kind of grassroots things that can make a big difference by making sure you have water features in your garden, for example, maintaining nice um, species rich hedgerows, having kind of pollinator pit stops, as people call them, with um, species rich um, seed mixes. Then on a kind of slightly larger scale, we have the idea of um, green infrastructure like green roofs in towns and cities, the idea that um, developments should be green and hopefully that will become more of a thing with laws like biodiversity net gain coming through. Um, and then things like natural flood management as well, allowing the rivers to have a kind of floodplain and continue their kind of natural meandering rather than trying to channelize them is very important for connectivity as well. So there's plenty of things that can be done. And I, from what I understand, a lot of our community groups we work with are doing loads of this stuff already and it's really fantastic um so you should also give yourselves a pat on your back that you probably almost certainly are connecting surrey um, and, and contributing to um that wider wider connectivity across that bigger network um and hopefully this has given you a bit of context um and ecological backing to know what you're doing is definitely the right thing and maybe give you a few different ideas about projects for the future that can also enhance our connectivity so yeah thank you very much that's fabulous ben thank thank you so much really really interesting um what you've shared with us and i think it's um just shows just how important um all of our wonderful communities that we're working with um, are able to get involved with that to increase that connectivity. So fabulous. So if you do have some questions for Ben, please do pop them in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and I'm sure there might be a few things that you want to, to ask him about with all of that. So wonderful. Thank you much, very much again, Ben. Um, so our next speaker today is, I would like to introduce you to, is Tim Hopkin, who is the founder of the Land App. And without further ado, Tim, I will pass directly over to you. Great. Thank you, Emma. Um, so hello, everyone. Lovely to see you all today. So yes, yeah, so I set up the Land App but just a bit of context um, for those that know the area, which I'm sure most of you do, is that I'm from uh, Shackleford, so just outside Godalming. Uh, so quick intro on how the land app started. Um, I, we've got a 90 acre family farm. I'm fourth generation. I was trying to work out how we would take the farm forward without running out of money. Obviously a massive issue if you manage land. The funding is disappearing quite quickly for farmers. And so I studied permaculture and regenerative agriculture about 13 years ago uh, down at Cowdery Estate and the Sustainability Centre. And essentially the land app is the output of that. So it's, it's how do we support land managers and communities to make well-informed strategic decisions on how they use their land and assets. So I'm going to run through this. I'm going to try and go as quick as I can because I might try and show you the software as well, uh, which is free to use for communities uh, under our premium uh, licence. Um, and all this data that you create could then be sent or shared with Ben for Ben to start modeling the future connectivity that he was just chatting about. So quickly running through. So context is we're in an ecological and climate emergency. I think we all agree with that. We've only got a finite amount of land, <laughs> our, our unique resource. And the way that we feel about it is um, it's software and data, as Ben was just explaining, can really highlight opportunities and help tell a story about how land and nature and ecological systems can be restored. So we really see data as a source for good um, to help people like yourselves make really well-informed decisions about how you use your land and assets. And ideally, the objective is to connect those projects to funding opportunities um, as you go forward. So context is ecological and climate emergency, we feel that software and data can help uh, change the trajectory towards something slightly more positive. Bit of context, so from starting the company in 2015, we really got going in 2017. We've now got somewhere between seven and a half million and eight million hectares of land has been mapped on the software by our customers who are predominantly Savills, Struts, RSPB, Sandringham, the Wildlife Trust, 
um, and we're partners with Ordnance Survey Land Registry in UK HAB. So, um, yeah, hopefully made a relatively useful dent uh, in the land sector, just helping as many people as we can through the tool. What do we do? We basically help land managers or communities like yourselves get a digital twin of the land as it currently stands, co-design a future plan. So a little bit like what Ben was just saying, where are there opportunities to create enhancements? That is your future plan, which you can design in collaboration with different stakeholders, advisors, or your teams, of course, sorry, Wildlife Trust, to then access funding ideally where it's available. Uh, then those projects can be delivered, they become the next baseline, and you keep going around this virtuous loop, loop ever improving the quality of land. So just quickly running through, because I'm going to try and show you the software, is uh, you can get a, a digital twin, a digital copy of the land at the click of a button. We've just completed a project with Surrey County Council. So there's a chance if you're a parish or town uh, that you'll be able to access this data for free under the license with Surrey County Council. Uh, we can talk about that afterwards maybe. Um, on the software, you see the um, market opportunities or incentives. So this is the likes of the Bug Life B line, which is the big red thing that you can see here as Ben was talking about, priority habitats, et cetera, et cetera. You can see all that. Um, in the software for free. And then you can design your future plan. In this case, it's a farm example. This is countryside stewardship. So the environmental scheme that uh, government funds farmers to deliver. So you can do that. And as the project is designed, you can see that it calculates the value that you're gonna get paid uh, for the, those projects. But whizzing through, we've also got a mobile app we're about to release, which helps you capture data on the ground. And like I was saying, you can collaborate with advisors, um, colleagues, uh, the likes of Surrey County Council, so that you can start to kind of progress forward these land-based projects uh, as a collective rather than in a silo. So again, another really useful function of software is it allows that collaborative design of these projects. It's a little bit more technical, but basically the beauty of LandApp is it allows those projects that are created in separate maps to be uh, aggregated to a landscape level. So Surrey, um, Surrey Wildlife Trust would be able to help you all and then aggregate that up to a landscape plan. So like Ben was just saying, as you all start to design these future plans that maybe start to align, you create more connectivity through the ecosystems that you're regenerating and the likes of Surrey County Council, Surrey Wildlife Trust would be able to see that and support you individually to start to uh, work towards this sort of greater contribution to a connected landscape. So the software does that um, by default. It also then calculates the, um, your uplift, so the difference between your baseline and your future plan in uh, the language of UK HAB, so for biodiversity net gain, for carbon uh, sequestration, as well as nitrate neutrality uh, as well. So that happens as an offshoot of designing the map, is that data flows through into the metrics dashboard that calculates the uplift, which is basically what underpins the argument for funding as you're restoring nature. Uh, we've also done some connectivity work as well. Um, uh, Dan, my colleague, has been working closely with Ben. Uh, this is the, the circuit theory that we've built into the software, which looks at the different classifications of land type. So it looks at, say, woodland, scrub, hedges, et cetera. And then uh, you can run a connectivity analysis on that to look at how fragmented or connected your landscape is to help you put in the different little elements that would create a greater connectedness. It doesn't produce the visual output that Ben just showed, so the slight difference in the models. But again, um, as Ben absolutely rightly said, everything we've got to be working on as a collective is how do we create a greater connected landscape? Uh, that's either woodland and scrub for say um, mammals to move through, or indeed it could be wetlands, uh, but we need to create a strategically create a more connected landscape. That connectivity analysis can produce an output that shows the uplift in the connectivity of an ecosystem based on where it is today to where it can be in the future. And again, we can help you with that. Um, this is slightly above and beyond this uh, talk maybe, but all of the data that you, you create can be shared, as I say, to Ben and the Surrey Wildlife Team, and they can then move that data effortlessly into their GIS software for further analysis. Um, so the software is, land up is connected to other systems for further um, uh, sort of insight that can be gleaned from the, the project work. And probably to say that, you know, we've, we've built this um, tool in very close collaboration with a lot of our customers, um, many of whom you might recognize the names of. So although we uh, really focus on the building of the software, we you know, always get pulled into the projects, which we absolutely love. And that's how we work out how to improve and develop the next element of the platform uh, to help add as much value as possible. Um, lastly, just on, on this presentation, anyone can sign up for free, just need to go to landapp.com. 
uh, join for free, and you can come in and start using uh, some of the core functions. Um, so that's the presentation. And I thought because everyone always just wants to see the software, um, I would actually show it to you while I've got a moment. So this is our family farm. I might show you this because I'm running out of time. So just for context uh, where we are, so there's Guildford, uh, Godalming, et cetera. So we're Norney Farm. Um, so Mark from the Surrey Wildlife Trust came out and did a natural capital baseline of the, of the farm as part of the uh, NERF project that we're doing, which is sort of a, a, a model to try and work out how uh, to unlock funding sources to natural capital projects. So that was the baseline that Mark created for us. And then with uh, Mark and Ben Habgood on Monday, we actually enhanced the future design for the farm. So here you can see we're starting to design in market gardens, orchard, grading the edges, putting in ponds, agroforestry, as well as shelter belts, uh, which are tiered with scrub and potentially a solar, solar panel project down, to, down here. So what's the time? I've got three minutes. Okay, I'm just gonna do a quick demo from scratch. So community. So to show you how it works, let's come down to Shackleford. Okay, move forward. So here we go. So here's Shackleford. So as a community group, what you can do is you can come in here and say, right, we're gonna design in some new uh, projects. We're gonna freehand draw, uh, let's call it just a project. And we're gonna start to draw in some features. So we're gonna say, okay, well, let's not do the farm, let's do somewhere else. So we could say, right, we're gonna pop in a load of trees, right? Here are gonna be our trees, et cetera. Obviously I could do this nice and neat if I wanted to. There we go. And we can now buffer those. Now I am whizzing through this. And of course we do training. We've got loads of help guidance online, but uh, just to quickly show you how it will work. So here now we've drawn in our trees. We're now gonna put maybe um, some horticulture here potentially. So again, let's just change the color of this and we can add some text to it. Um, okay, just given I'm running out of time, you can sort of see the rough points. We could then add Ben in as a collaborator to this map, add Ben in as a publisher and all of the data that we've just added onto this map would flow directly to Ben into his account, which Ben could then uh, aggregate into that natural capital dashboard and start to do connectivity analysis. So I guess the way you could see Land App is a simple, easy to use free tool to allow you to work collaboratively as a community, but also engage with other bodies such as Surrey Wildlife Trust, Surrey County Council, so that we're all collectively moving forward towards delivering a greater natural environment um, for the wider community. So I'll probably leave it there for now. Uh, if you do come in and create an account, actually jump on help, that's where all the help guidance is, but otherwise we're happy to help wherever we can. So yeah, hopefully that's enough from me. Fabulous. Thank, thank you very much indeed, um, Tim. It's yeah, really interesting to see um, your uh, land up as well. And just to see how it all's going to start to connect together. I think with, you know, with going back to what Ben was saying as well, with the connections with Kent Wildlife Trust and the Bug Life and you guys all coming on board that we're all walking going in that same direction. So really useful um, to see how everybody in our communities who have joined us today can, can access that information and be able to, to help on that journey. So brilliant, thank you very much. And again, if you do have a, have a question for Tim, um, please pop it in the Q&A down at, at the bottom and we'll come back and address those at the end um, of the session. So our final speaker, we have the lovely Katie Fielding from um, Surrey Wildlife Trust. She is our hedge Hedgerow Heritage, I put, make sure I put my teeth in Katie, Hedgerow mm -hmm. Heritage Project Manager here at Surrey Wildlife Trust and she's going to tell you a little bit more about her project. So over to you Katie. Thanks Emma. Right, I'll just share my screen. There we go. I'm hoping everybody can see that. I'm not being shouted at so hopefully we can. So hi everyone. Uh, some of you may have met me before in various points along the project journey. I was going to tell you a little bit about hedgerows, wildlife and climate change and how hedgerows could be really helpful in some of your plans if you're looking at what you can do in your local community. So first of all, why care about hedgerows? So to start off with, they're an amazing habitat. They provide so many benefits to wildlife, corridors through our countryside, our 
farmland, our urban areas, our towns, and of course our community spaces. They provide a wide variety of ecosystem services and also do an amazing job at capturing carbon as well. And I don't think I've found any graphics that really sum this up any better than this one from the People's Trust for Endangered Species, which is showing the shelter that they provide, the soil protection, they help reduce pollution, flood control, pest control, wood fuel, wildlife and pollinator benefits, shade for our livestock as well as our crops. So a really fantastic graphic and a whole myriad of reasons of why I care about hedgerows. My screen has decided to uh, freeze. So hopefully, there we go. So just building on that amazing habitat, there aren't that many habitats in the world, let alone the UK, that can boast over 500 plant species 60 species of nesting birds, many hundreds, if not thousands of invertebrate species, almost all of our native mammal species as being as recorded, as supported by hedgerows, which when you think of their size relative to other habitats in this country is really quite an incredible amount. And on that importance, they're recognized as one of our most important wildlife habitats and a real critical wildlife reserve and their linear features contribute greatly to the biodiversity of farmland. And so just to take that in, without the hedgerows that we have in our farmland areas, as well as our other spaces, there wouldn't be as big a biodiversity as there is. There wouldn't be as many small mammals or invertebrates. And to build on that, hedgerow length has been found to positively associate with small mammal biomass. And biomass is only something that we're really starting to talk about in the last few years, if not decade. You hear a lot of talks about extinction, extinction events, threatened species, but actually it's not just about whether a species is present, it's about what kind of volume they're there. We don't just want the one harvest mouse or the odd butterfly in our areas. We want them to be in a greater abundance. We want big thriving populations. And the fact that hedgerow length is seen to positively associate with bigger and more robust populations is a really valuable thing. Despite all of these benefits and our understanding of just how important hedgerows are, there is still a huge absence of data surrounding hedgerows, whether that's where they are, what condition they're in, or how to look after them well, even though so many species rely on them. So speaking of those species, this is just a few of uh, the photos I've taken of wildlife benefiting from hedgerows. So a few of those invertebrate species, we have stag beetles benefiting from the deadwood and rotting leaves at the base of hedgerows, seven spot ladybird, a beautiful white admiral butterfly nectaring on bramble. And again, bramble is very much seen as a pest species that people are ripping out of their gardens and their maybe their community spaces. But actually in the right places, in the right kind of volume, it's so valuable and so much wildlife relies on it. Uh, I have so many pictures of birds in hedgerows, but I always come back to this very young, juvenile, wet and bedraggled wood pigeon that looked like he really needed the benefit and shelter and protection of the hedgerow on this particular day. Uh, on the reptiles, so we've got an adder and a small young grass snake there. We wouldn't always think of reptiles as benefiting from hedgerows, but they will use them as commuting routes and safe passage through our countryside. And then this harvest mouse is from the British Wildlife Centre. I sadly have not been lucky enough to get a photo like this of harvest mice in the wild. But harvest mice are benefiting from hedgerow margins as well, as well as lots of other small mammal species. So corridors, I feel like when we talk about the benefits of hedgerows, we always come back to corridors, but there's so much more to it than just connecting the landscape. We're linking, we're expanding, we're commuting. So obviously it allows our wildlife a safe passage through our countryside, parks, gardens, urban areas, even cities. And let's face it, those areas aren't getting any safer for wildlife. So the more safe passages we can provide, then the better. Um, corridors also help to prevent populations from becoming isolated. So small populations of species that can't reach other, other small pockets of the same species can become isolated and become much more at risk of local extinctions events. So obviously by having that well-managed 
looked after network of hedgerows, we can help to prevent that. But also it's not just about stopping populations from shrinking. Hedgerows also allow species and populations and territories to expand. And that's what I think is so positive about it. We're always talking about being on the defensive and stopping populations from getting smaller. Hedgerows can help populations get larger, can help territories to become bigger again, expanding populations ranges. And also commuting, my favorite thing that hedgerows are used for by wildlife. I love the concept of wildlife commuting back and forth through our wildlife, through our habitats. So bees, for example, will use the same routes along hedgerows to their favorite nectaring spots. Bats at night will use a network of hedgerows to forage and echolocate through the landscape, as well as dormice, just to name a few of the various species using it for this way. And with all hedgerow talks, it's almost impossible not to talk about the hazel dormouse, one of our most iconic and yet threatened hedgerow species. They're very much using hedgerows as a dispersal corridor to link between small copses or other small habitats that they can use but can't meet all of their needs and so wouldn't necessarily support a viable population on their own but can help them move around. They're an arboreal species so even a small gap in a hedgerow will be seen as quite a large obstacle for a dormouse when it's moving around. But what's more interesting is that hedgerows have been found to be a habitat in their own right for the dormouse. And a study by the Royal Holloway London found that there are as high numbers of dormice in hedgerows as there are woodlands, and that's populations living. So not only are they providing that uh, service to move through the landscape, they're also just living in the hedgerows full time anyway. So obviously a loss of hedgerows equals isolated populations of dormice, as well as lots of other species, which could lead to local extinctions. And just to demonstrate just how valuable a hedgerow can be to a dormouse, I'm going to take you through the life in the year of a dormouse. So a dormouse emerges from hibernation and begins feeding on blossoms from plants such as blackthorn and hawthorn, a hedgerow staple. Moving on to seeds and other things like these ash keys, and blossoms from honeysuckle. In the summer, they're also adding to their diet with invertebrates and insects such as these aphids. And then moving on into the autumn, they are feasting on blackberries and of course, hazelnuts as well. So as you can see, they have such a varied diet. They're quite a high maintenance little species really, but they are very cute. So we let them get away with it and keep providing that banquet year round. And from, from a mouse to a flying species. Uh, bats, although flying around, are still really, really reliant on hedgerows. And uh, those linear features in the countryside really help for them with commuting routes and aids their navigation through echolocation. And a network of well-connected hedgerows and other linear features like streams and rivers and woodland edges in the landscape allows many species of bat to extend their foraging range and roosting capacity. Not only that, there's obviously that shelter element as well. So if a bat goes too far to be able to make it back in one night to its main roost, it can seek shelter in a well-managed hedgerow and roost there if needed. And of course, a hedgerow is a fantastic food source for a bat, feasting on those many hundreds, if not thousand species of invertebrates and insects. So from the wildlife benefits to the benefits to us in the form of ecosystem services. And uh, there are many definitions of ecosystem services, but I have found that the one at the top there being the best. And just to focus on that, that contribute to making life possible and worth living. So to name a few of these ecosystem services, hedgerows are known to be helping to increase and protect water quality preventing nutrients and other pollutants reaching our water bodies, which I feel like we're becoming more aware of daily, just how polluted our rivers and waterways are, and hedgerows are helping with that. They protect from wind, water and soil erosion in a farming environment, whether that's crops or livestock. Pollination services, so providing nectar and pollen sources, hedges enhance population size and diversity of pollinators. So again, have that positive influence on biomass of species. And 
I'm always my most impressive fact about hedgerows is that they're filtering out particulate matter in urban centers, known to be able to filter out heavy metals even and physically protect us from pollution. When I, talk, I give a talk on hedgerows, just about the benefits from them that goes on for an hour. And I talk a lot more about the benefits of hedgerows in urban and city environments and how they do such a better job at protecting us from pollution than individually planted trees, which is what we see in our cities and towns at the moment. Imagine if we replace that with a well-maintained, healthy, biodiverse hedgerow, the benefits that we could gain then. And then a little bit more on ecosystem services, they can generally be broken down into four types, whether that's supporting services, nutrients and water cycling, soil formation, primary production, regulating services, climate control and pollution removal, provisioning services, food, medicines, building materials, cultural services, societal appreciation of nature and the environment. And hopefully even with the limited amount I've told you already, hedgerows are providing us with many services in all four of these different types already. Whether that's in an urban environment or in a farmland environment. And then just quickly on carbon capture and recent-ish study 2021 from the Sustainable Farming Incentive DEFRA's plan for piloting and launching the scheme found that there are 9 million tonnes of carbon already stored in England's hedgerows but still so overlooked, we're always talking about planting more trees. So imagine if we were to protect our existing hedgerows better, manage them well and plant new ones, just how much carbon we could be capturing then. So how are hedgerows doing this? Hopefully at this point you're like, wow, hedgerows are amazing, but how are they doing this all? So really the key is biodiversity. And the key to biodiversity is variety. Variety equals lots of niches, lots of micro niches that different species can capitalize on and come into and thrive in. And a hedgerow, a well-managed, well-understood hedgerow has lots of components and this hedgerow shows it all perfectly. Hopefully you can see the standard tree here. So you would leave one or two specimens to grow into normal trees, giving it that height and age diversity. Uh, you have the shrubby layer, which is often what people think of when you think of a hedgerow. You have the hedgerow bottom, so the stems, the root network, the deadwood, the rotting leaf matter, uh, the bank and ditches, obviously very popular with amphibians, and then the hedgerow margin as well. So this nice buffer area that protects the rest of the hedge and has a whole variety of different plant species in where your harvest mice are gonna call home and also attract lots of different invertebrates and other species as well. But management is key. Uh, you can't just plant a hedgerow and think, great, I'll have all those ecosystem services and benefits for wildlife, please. You can't achieve all of the benefits to hedgerows without good management. You need that thick, bushy, like shrub layer, a strong base without gaps, and really the key is that hedgerows don't look after themselves. They are a man-made feature and they need man-made, sympathetic, well-understood intervention. But if you get it right, it's not very onerous at all. But obviously if you get it wrong, then you're gonna have some hedgerows a bit like this. And they certainly won't be stock proof. Now, many people think that the biggest threat to hedgerows is under management, but I would say it's over management. So constant long-term trimming at the same height places a hedge under great stress. It leads to deterioration and a bottomless mushroom shape. So you get these really thick, hard knuckles where it's being cut back to year after year after year. And if I go back to this slide, you can really see in this, these pictures that real mushroom effect. And you know that this hedge is under great stress and is ultimately going to die out when it starts to look like this. A lot of the hedge laying that we're doing as part of the project, we find a lot of rot and, die, and dying back in the stems of hedgerows, which are being overmanaged year after year. And what we want to urge people to do is to take on the life cycle approach and recognize the value of the life cycle of a hedgerow and that a healthy hedge may not always be the neatest hedge as well. And part of the life cycle approach is that you are slowing down, but not altogether altering or halting the natural changes that the hedge wants to go through. And by doing this on a hedgerows across a holding, so say in a community space, you can achieve the ideal mosaic of different shapes and sizes of hedgerows 
some which have been cut back, some with a bounty of blossoms and berries potentially. And this is what helps to make our countryside so special. So another fantastic graphic to finish on here, which gives you all the different types of hedgerows out there and how to get them into good management. And I just really wanna draw attention to the graphic here at the bottom right. And if you can see, this is a hedgerow that's being cut on a two to three year rate, rate. And it's never cut back to the same point again. You always leave an inch or so's growth. So your hedgerow is always getting bigger and appreciating the life cycle approach. And it will get to the point where it's too big for the area and it needs to go back to being rejuvenated. And that's either coccus down to the ground or laid. Now, I also promote another way of um, managing hedgerows where you cut one side one year, the top the next, and the other side the third year. And that's a three year rotation. You can also do this on a five year rotation. Cut one year, nothing the next, top on the third year, nothing the next year, and on the fifth year, you cut the final side. So there are a variety of ways of doing it depending on the hedgerow you've got and what space you're working in as well. But if anybody would like more information on this, then I'm more than happy to provide it. And as part of Hedgerow Heritage, we are providing free management plans for hedgerows as well. So if anyone is interested in that, then I'm really happy to help. And I just want to finish by saying this little bit in the bottom corner here, no matter what hedge you're starting with, there is a way to bring it back to the healthy hedge cycle with good management. So thank you very much for listening. That's fabulous. Thank you, Katie. Fascinating. Um, it, every time you talk about about hedgerows it's it's wonderful to hear your passion coming through and just how amazing hedgerows are um and just how much they do um so that's, that's brilliant so thank you for, thank you very very much katie um we do have quite a lot um of questions that are popping in i can see the number pushing up now so i'm going to invite all of our speakers to put their cameras back on um to join us so that we can see everybody who's been talking today wonderful thank you very much um, so if I read a few of these questions out and then I'll direct them directly to one of you speakers, if you're then if you'd be happy then to to answer that. Um, um, one thing I just want to say, let me hang on, let me just pull that up so I can see. Um, we did have a question come through from Philip Partridge just to say about will the slideshows be sent around. Um, we are have recorded the session um, and you will be able to access it on the website. Um, the link to that has, has been put in the chat. Um, so all of our um, previous websites, uh, sorry, previous webinars are on that website as well. So rather than um, the slideshows being sent around, you can access all of that on our website. So hopefully that's all right with you, Philip. Thank you for that. Right. OK, so we have a question come through from Claire Mathers. Um, and I think this one came in when Tim was talking um, regarding the land app. Can, you, can your land app tell you exactly who owns the land? Uh, it can't tell you who owns it as a person, but you can see the land registry title. So if you click on the title, you can then pay the three pounds to see who owns it. Um, so yeah, that's the route that you can find out who owns the past of land. Okay, fabulous. Thank you, Tim. And then we had a message come through from um, Martin Angel. I think this one, Ben, is coming to you, if that's okay. Um, planning applications are mandated to deliver a 10% biodiversity enhancement, but not necessarily on site. How can improving local connectivity on site be included in such um, enhancements? So that's on behalf of Martin Angel, Ben, if you can answer that one. Yeah, it's a good question. If anyone else wants to chip in, feel free. Um, but at the moment, uh, connectivity is not a mandatory part of the biodiversity net gain metric. So it's gone through a few iterations um, and it was in it in version two. But then because it was a little bit subjective and there wasn't a standard way of all of the people using that metric actually scoring their connectivity, it was removed in version three because it was kind of just it wasn't working very well. Um, and I don't know if they have plans to put it back in, but at the moment there's no kind of official official 
metric for connectivity in the net gain metric. That being said, things that are in the net gain metric don't necessarily exist in isolation from connectivity. So for example, um, one of the things you can score um, your offsetting on is strategic importance. And it may be that you consider something of strategic importance if, for example, it's in a beeline or if it's in a BOA. And obviously those things are based around connectivity. So you may be kind of including it in that context as well. Um, and a lot of the things that you might be doing in your offsetting, such as you know uplifting the quality of a grassland, um, putting in hedgerows and things like that, all of those are going to enhance connectivity as well. So um, I, I've probably talked around the question a little bit, but to summarize, there isn't, no, there isn't an official requirement for it to be included, but it will hopefully naturally be included by a lot of the things that you will do just by going through the process. And the person doing your plan based on your biodiversity net gain metric will obviously be implementing those things in order to reach that 10%. Okay, th thank you, Ben. Hopefully that um, answers that question. And I'm sure um, potentially a few other people will find that very helpful. Um, just um, carrying on with the sort of the, the connectivity side of things. Um, so whether Ben or Tim want to have a think about this one, there's a very good question that's come in about how connectivity could be encouraged across busy A roads in Surrey. So I don't know if, if perhaps um, Ben or Tim want to carry on with that one. Well, um, a really, really nice and current example of that is the Green Bridge project um, that's currently taking place over the A3. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if people are aware of that, but um, essentially around Junction 10, the A3 M25 junction, the junction is being redone by Highways England because it's a nasty junction. Um, and as mitigation for the amount of the surrounding heathland area and other reserves that will be damaged in that process, they're going to be putting in a green bridge over the A3. Um, these are things that are quite, quite well established in Europe and other countries, mm. but there's not many very good examples of them in the UK. So we're hoping and optimistic that this will be a really kind of nice uh, flagship, great example um, of one in the UK um, and be you know, kind of stand standout example of that. So it's going to be a long process. And I think it's going to take about five years for the entire thing to be done. They've just started the works on it very recently and made the traffic around that area worse than usual. Um, but yeah, so that that is a lovely example of something being done over an A road. And I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in or Katie, if you know any more about that than I do. I don't think I know anything more about it, but yeah, as you say, it's uh, intention is that a green bridge is going across to link up some of the heathland area. So the idea being that they, there will be heathland plants planted on it as well to encourage the wildlife to move between the two areas. Mm. I think the bit that I would add is that this idea of being able to quantify connectivity gives a metric argument as to why more connectivity needs to be established or to highlight where connectivity bridges could be, whether it's across um, A roads or bigger roads, or indeed uh, to halt development that might be going in the wrong place. So I think the ability to quantify connectivity gives such a clear cut argument to new interventions to create more ecosystem bridges. So I think yeah, just kind of actually that example of a green bridge really highlights the importance of, um, of this connectivity modeling. So yeah. That's yeah really and we did do a few um i don't know how useful they were in the end but we did do a few scenarios for that green bridge in terms of considering different placements and different widths and stuff like that so yeah definitely hopefully something that can be used more in the future on these projects yeah and actually i wonder whether on a point with that is as the communities start to build more future plans and you can start to do what's the connectivity today what's it going to be in the future and then we can start to see how multiple community projects could come together it starts to identify new project areas that need to be set up to establish mm -hmm. more, and, and ideally that will open up new funding streams. So I think the more that communities are engaged in these future designs to create more connectivity, mm -hmm. it'll kind of be a ripple effect that keeps on getting more and more. Because I think we want, you know, if we could get Surrey to be the most connected county in the country, that would be an amazing as, as, you know, achievement. So yeah, I think so. it's a great way of how we can all work together. 
Yeah, absolutely. And just listening to your all, all of your presentations today, just how many other um, organisations are involved, and by getting the all of the community engaged in that, um, we're you know we're we're working in the right direction because just sort of segueing on from that Rob um, Searle has put a question in the chat as a well not really a question but just more of a comment um, on that that ha you know it would be fantastic to have green bridges over the M3 on Chubb and Common as as well um, um, you know but will will money ever for this ever be available or something um, the more we can mm. the more we can get people engaged and, and involved then um, hopefully people will be able to take notice of all the wonderful things that we're doing so Katie I've got a couple of questions for you um if you are ready um so uh, we've had a wonderful um a couple of things come through um from uh, Caroline regarding hedgerows that so many are just buzz cut every year um they're so short very narrow and thinly spread if this practice was stopped by councils landowners and farm owners surely this would help to start with is. These hedgerows are just cut at the wrong time. Berries are chopped off, too feeble to have nesting places for birds. Um, and she has quoted a, an example of a hedgerow in Norbury Park um, that's managed by, by Surrey Wildlife Trust, which is being cut to such an extent um, that trees are marked that are left to be cut. And perhaps it'd be something to talk to farmers in Norbury Park about how they manage their hedgerows. Um, sort of how, what are your sort of feelings going forward with that, how we can make sure that we are moving in that right direction? Perfect. Uh, a few points. Firstly, apologies to those that can hear my dog barking in the background. Perfectly timed. Uh, two, um, it's actually a misconception that Surrey Wildlife Trust manage the hedgerows on Norbury Park. It's They are managed by the tenant farmers. However, we are working closely with Surrey County Council about understanding hedgerows better. And it is my hope to be able to circulate hedgerow management plans to the council as well as tenant farmers in Norbury Park and across Surrey as well, which would be a huge achievement of the Hedgerow Heritage Project. Uh, the short answer to the question is, yes, it would be great if we stopped cutting our hedgerows back to the same point all the time. And that does not respect the life cycle of a hedgerow. We need to allow our hedgerows to grow at least a little bit every year. And that's why we talk about this three or five year management where they're getting bigger and bigger and bushier and bushier. And probably a lot of the hedgerows in this area needs to be rejuvenated now. So either coppice back down to the ground to promote lots of young, fresh, bushy growth or laid where they could be, which again would promote lots of young, bushy, healthy growth. But the practicalities of this for some for some landowners and land managers is that it can't all be done at once. Hedge laying, if you're not doing it yourself, it's quite a, can be quite a costly thing, or there are lots of ways of doing it. And doing it yourself, it takes time. So maybe if you individually, if you are laying a hedge, you're looking at laying 10 yards a day, potentially, if you're doing it well. There are lots of options. And I think promoting an awareness of the life cycle approach, because a lot of landowners aren't deliberately trying to hurt their hedgerows. There is just a, such a lack of awareness of how to manage them well. So I think engaging with these people, talking to them about that healthy management, how to look after them better is a great first step and encouraging all landowners and land managers to be a little bit more sympathetic to their hedgerows is also a really good thing. Yes, fabulous. I think that's all that's all part of your project, isn't it, Katie? Because um, that's Caroline has mentioned as well of whether or not you will be giving talks to landowners um, as well. So I think that's as you I think you've covered that as well. It's it's um, it's all part part of the plan. But yes, it does take time, doesn't it? It's it's something that's that your project is is how long have you been going now, Katie? Your project it's. It's been going three years and it's running until early 2024. So started at the really opportune time of late March 2020. A great time to launch any project. I'm sure people will agree. But uh, yeah, we are looking for a little bit of an extension with the Heritage Lottery as well. because We're very lucky to have had funding for them and very grateful to them and their players. And I am giving lots of talks to landowners and land managers as well. 
fabulous, brilliant. Yes, Caroline has said she'd um, she'd like to talk to SES and can pass on information about management. So, um, so we've got uh, some help there, um, spreading the word. Um, and another, just also that a question come in from Richard saying about um, can Surrey Wildlife Trust put interested volunteers in touch with landowners to do some hedge laying for them if cost is an issue? Is that something, Katie, that you can facilitate? Uh, yes, I'm sure it could be. So I do a lot of work with the Surrey Hedge Laying Group. Um, and also another group and also the organisation Hedges and Hurdles, who do a lot of professional hedge laying. So part of the project is to roll out management plans to lots of different landowners and land managers. And as part of that, if lay hedge laying is what would be valuable on their land, it would be great to have a bank of more than just these organisations who I know that Surrey Hedge Laying Group are already at capacity for the next for next year, so the 23-24 winter season. So having more people that would be willing to be involved with this would be a fantastic thing, yes. Yeah, and Richard's just put a, a, a second comment following on from what you've just said, Katie, that um, places like Merist Wood College um, have lots of young practical habitat management students who need 150 hours of work experience. Maybe potentially that's that's some uh, some youth you can um, tap into, Katie. I'm not, whether or not you've got that in your plan already. We have, have had chats with Maris Wood, and it is worth uh, mentioning that we run a young person's hedge laying session once a month on a Sunday. And all of the details of those, though, we've only got one more now because the, it's the end of the winter season, so the February one. But we'll be looking to do that again from September. So if there are any people under the age of, basically under the age of 26, uh, that would like to come out and do some practical hedge laying, then they would be very welcome. And that um, information is on our website, I'm presuming, Katie, is it? It is, yeah, under the volunteering section. Okay, fabulous. So potentially, Richard, that's um, um, something that you could follow up on. And yes, and get lots of people involved. Fabulous. So we have one last question. Um, Katie, you seem to be the, 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 the person of the hour because we have a, a question coming from Amy. Um, just wondering if there is a good website um, or reference book so to be able to get those diagrams and that you shared um, or management information for hedgerows. So rather than just from our website, if there's some other recommendations you could give. There certainly are. So there is a project website, which is Save Our Hedgerows. So that's a really good place to start. But honestly, Hedgelink, which was one of the diagrams, Hedgelink is a fantastic resource on all things hedgerows. And then also the People's Trust for Endangered Species. They have a lot on hedgerows as well. And then you've got uh, the National Hedge Lane Society as well. So there's lots, there's lots of really fantastic resources out there. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I think that's our final question answered. I'm just having a quick scan through the chat. And I think um, questions have been answered in there as well. Jacqueline, you've had your question answered by Billy, I can see. Um, so wonderful. So I think um, with that, we will sort of um, finish our, our webinar this afternoon. Um, just want to say a massive big thank you, as always, to, to all of our speakers with your, your passion and your knowledge for your subject areas. And just to see, it's just amazing just to see how it all links together um, and we're, we're all working towards the same goal. So thank you very much for your time. Um, wonderful, absolutely wonderful and very inspiring, uh, as always. Um, and then just for those of you who are listening and watching today, thank Thank you once again for um, coming to join us today. It's, it's fabulous to have so many people um, signing up and for these webinars. So as we said, it is our final webinar today, but that's not the end of the journey. Um, so we would, would, Claire and her team have got lots of other events that are going to be, that are being planned for the future. And we'd love to have you to come and attend those different events. Um, it's, we sort of think of it as like a sort of a nice support package for all our communities that we're working with that we want to be able to help you um, on your journeys going forward. So we will be running, Claire and her team are going to be running a couple of online group mentoring sessions that they'd like to, you to be involved with and organising two 
in-person workshops in the springtime and a celebration event um, later on in the year for all of our communities and further information from Claire and her team will come out to you on that um, once all the details have been finalized. Um, oh, Katie's got a little little hand up. Would oh, you like to hand. say something, mm. Katie? I would, yes, please, Emma. Yes, um, please go I just ahead. wanted to say that um, if people were interested in hedge laying and other events with the project, we do have our first beginners hedge laying competition on Sunday, the 5th of February, running at Tightings Farm. All of the competitor spots are now taken, but we would love as many spectators to come down as possible. We will have wood fired pizzas and coffee and cake from two organisations from the Surrey Hills Enterprise. The national champion in the south of England style will be judging the competition. So it should be a really fun day and you can learn a little bit about hedge laying if you'd like to come down and all the details are on our website. Oh, Katie, when you said wood fired pizza and cake, that's it. You, I think you grabbed everybody's attention. Um, so, yes, thank you for that. Um, yes, yeah, so we've that's it. So we've come to the end of our, our session today. Um, oh, it looks like, yes, we've got some some links in the chat have gone in about the hedge lane competition. Um, thank you very much, Amy, for, for putting that in. Thank you once again, everybody, for um, attending today and we really look forward to seeing you at future events and you being part of our our big community so many thanks for joining us and we will sign off then for now good afternoon thanks all bye